Dialectical Behavior Therapy was created in the 1980s by Marsha Linehan in Seattle, Washington. Today, DBT is taught all over the world. We're two therapists who believe everyone can benefit from DBT skills. I'm Kate. I'm Michelle. And And this this is is DBT and Me. Well, hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. I'm to be back. (laughs) I'm laughing because on Zoom, Jin is walking directly in front of Kate. (laughs) And probably showing the part of the cat that everyone sees the most of. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, if you hear him, I don't know, sniffing the mic, don't do that. Um, The cat is here. There you go. That's true. And I'm here. Yay! So thanks to everybody so for supporting Michelle through when I was gone. Okay, I guess she needs support. That sounds weird. What I mean is thanks for not minding that I was in the hospital. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm fine. I'm recovering. Well, my five new holes and one fewer gallbladder seem to be doing all right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to all of you who have been through this, man, that shit hurts. Dear goodness. Um, I've heard people talk about, like, passing gallstones being as bad as childbirth, but I, <laughs> I don't know, man. That hurt a lot. Did you, so you were having gallstones? Is that how you knew the, your gall? I mean, I didn't know what was going on at all. I just You were just having was, intense pain kind of a thing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rapidly increasing intense pain. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I know anatomy vaguely well. So I was like, well, it's center and just right of center at my very upper abdomen just underneath my ribs. Uh, and I'm like, well, there's not a lot of organs there. Like, so pretty <laughs> sure, pretty sure it's the gallbladder. So, and I was right. So yeah, I had an emergency cholecystectomy. If anybody wants to know what the re- the word is. Co- cholecystectomy? Cystectomy, yes. Yeah. Cystectomy? Okay, I'm good. It's a I, weird word. It is really hard to say. <laughs> and also, I'm like, I why is it, what, apparently your gallbladder is your cholecyst i don't know because an ectomy is a taking something out yeah so i don't know what why your gallbladder is your cholecyst apparently or something um so anyway i'm back one fewer gallbladder and uh thanks for your patience because i also am realizing that my brain is half a bubble off plum today so i might be a little bit more (laughs) hesitant uh but we're gonna do a skill today called behavior chain analysis Um, And speaking of calling myself out, while I'm sure I learned this when I was going through DBT as a client when I was 19, Michelle and I haven't traditionally taught this in our groups. So I don't remember it. Mm -hmm. So if Michelle jumps in (laughs) and (laughs) rescues me a few times today, it's because uh, she'll talk more about her personal experience within a second, but she has more. (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's been a minute, it. though, for me. I know, it's been a minute, but, both yeah. of us, I guess, right? Because mm-hmm, you were pretty young true. when you worked at the girls' home, too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that was that was about 10 years ago now, so. Oh, there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, Michelle and I are going to stumble our <laughs> We're going to do this anyways. Because um, like we said when we did Ride the Wave, um, you know, we're through kind of the main DBT skills that are in each module. And so we've been reaching back into the depths of DBT to see what other skills we might have overlooked and not gone over. And with behavior chain analysis, um, I mean, with Ride the Wave, we said, which I was thinking about after we recorded that episode, actually, Kate, because I think we said in the episode, it's like, it's like emotion regulation and mindfulness, but it's it's everything. It's the stress it tolerance. Is everything. Like, <laughs> it touches on all the things, whereas behavior chain analysis, it, it goes nowhere. Like, literally in the... Uh, the it goes book. nowhere. No, it goes nowhere. <laughs> the book that we use, it's the first skill of the entire book. I know. It's all like page 20, and they just say it's a general handout. It's not a distress tolerance handout. It's not that an interpersonal funny. effectiveness handout. It's just a general handout. They get its hilarious. own section in our manual, but it goes under no module. <laughs> so That is hilarious. There you go. This is That yeah. was the everything skill, and this is the nothing skill. <laughs> it has that a little bit bad. of, yeah. That's not what I mean, but... Well, and you'll see when we go through it, it does touch on a lot of different stuff that we've already talked about 
with various well, skills. But yeah, it doesn't have a home. Like, touches it doesn't on home so much as we can take stuff and put it in. So maybe that's yeah. why it's first, is mm -hmm. that it's like a blank sheet, and as you learn skills, you can sort of start to slot them in yeah. to where they can be helpful in the process. Yeah, maybe? totally. Yeah, that's that makes way sense. Of thinking of it. Because, I mean, if you try to do this skill and you've learned no other DBT, um, one, I don't think you're going to want to go further with DBT. And <laughs> two, <laughs> two, you're going to feel in over your head and it's not going to go very well. That may sound really harsh, but, no, but, but it's, it's true. Because I was thinking exactly the opposite, not the oh, don't want to go further. Well, I was thinking like you don't technically need any DBT skills for this. Oh, that's like they're true. useful. They're mm -hmm. totally applicable. And... It, it literally doesn't reference any of them. Yeah, we're going to be you referencing could do them. This yeah. Without any other DBT skills. This could just be its own thing. Standalone thing. Yeah, I mean, that is yeah. true in a lot of ways because when we were you know, preparing for how are we going to present this skill or what are we going to talk about in the episode, we were going through, we were recognizing like, oh, this, yeah. this step you know, is in line with this skill. So we'll be talking about some skills, but you're right. Actually in the handouts that they have, they do not reference any DBT <laughs> skills. They don't Zero. reference check the facts. They don't reference please. They don't reference any of these things because maybe because it is why reference the book. wise mind. And I think the number of handouts yeah. from DBT that don't reference wise mind even once are like very few. slim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point. So maybe it really is going off of the assumption that you know nothing about GBT and we're going to, you know, start here. And then as you go along, you'll get better at this skill or you'll learn yeah. more of that kind of I thing. I think the so. assumption for a lot of people is that those who are coming into DBT are coming in for a very specific problem behavior, which is yeah. probably why this is first. Yeah, that's very I mean, true. I think the longer we do it, like we as in you and I, but also we as in like the therapeutic community, I think the mm -hmm. more broadly applicable we see DBT as being. So maybe this isn't as applicable mm -hmm. to the new sort of population that's in a lot of DBT groups. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the way that it was generally, you know, what's the word? Not fomented. Jesus Christ, Kate. Uh, anyway, Marshall Linehan meant it for folks with problems originally. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And even very specifically self-harm yeah. as the problem behavior. So I, yeah. I absolutely agree with that. And that is true that you know, now we know that DBT can be useful, you know, if you're struggling with depression or anxiety or even just general life stuff, DBT can really help. Um, and also it was not, <laughs> for, for the longest time, if somebody was say struggling with depression, their therapist would probably not refer them to a DBT group because mm -hmm. it's like, you're not self-harming, you're not drinking or using drugs, you know, DBT isn't the treatment for you. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> because, not going, I don't know. Yeah, you're not going out and gambling yeah. or having risky mm -hmm. other risky behaviors, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, exactly. You only go to DBT if you have a problem behavior. <laughs> yeah, that's kind that of the, the mindset. assumption, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's what behavior chain analysis is all about, um, is what DBT says is problem behaviors. And holy crap, if we decided to say that this was our drinking game today for this episode, don't <laughs> don't follow along because we'll be saying it a lot. I don't even really like the term problem behavior, but no. I can't think of anything else better to say. Shit what you want to stop doing? <laughs> That's so much longer though. It is. <laughs> yeah. So problem at least is better than like bad or poor That's, or something. Yeah, yeah that, really that, is, judgmental. that is a good point. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, and it is probably, yeah, a behavior that is creating problems in your life somewhere or another, which is why we're looking at it. Um, so to give a little more background, like Kate said, I have some experience with this skill because I just, <laughs> I've realized just the past couple episodes, I've talked a lot about when I worked at Phoenix House. Yep. Um, I talked about that a lot with Ride the Wave. Um, and I'm going to talk about it again here because this is where I learned this skill was when I was working at Phoenix House. I mean, that's where I first was introduced to DBT in general. Mm -hmm. But even before I think I started taking the girls to a DBT group, that wasn't my shift initially that I worked. And we still as staff, one of the things that we were trained on was how to do a behavior chain analysis. Because basically if a girl did something to get put in a hold, like I was talking about with Ride the Wave, um, mm -hmm. so she tried to assault someone 
or she did assault someone, um, or she self-harmed, or she um, ran away. Uh, that would be a common other thing that we would see. Basically, any time that they did something that majorly broke the rules of the house, they mm -hmm. were typically put on restrictions for about 24 hours. That meant you are in your room and you're not leaving your room. Um, you don't get to watch movies. You get to... Oh, they could come out of their room to eat meals, but they had to eat their meal after everyone else was done. And if they were out of their room, the other girls were not to talk to them. Um, so, like, while they were eating dinner. And that was really the only time they were out of their room. Was, like, to eat meals, shower, mm -hmm. go to the bathroom. That kind of thing. Other than that, you're in your room for about 24 hours after you would do any of these things. I can't remember what we called it. We had some term for it. But basically, they just lost all privileges. And, you know, they were Privileges. About... Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so, they... That would happen for about 24 hours. It would go on longer <laughs> if a girl was not complying with those conditions. Like if she would come out of her room and if she was talking to the other girls or if she did something else that would get her into more trouble, <laughs> then you are in your room for potentially multiple days in a row depending on whether or not you showed that you were going to comply or not. But after that 24-hour period, what would happen is that a staff member would have to sit down with her and do a behavior chain analysis. Um, and it's because of this that, I mean, I, mm, <laughs> I don't want to say I don't like this skill because I can see the value in it. However, I did so flipping many of these <laughs> that I would get burned out on doing behavior chain analyses <laughs> because um, sometimes I'd have to do them with like three girls in a day or, you know, if a girl had multiple problem behaviors, it's like, okay, we got to do two different ones for each different problem behavior. behavior. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I don't know. I got kind of worn out. Um, and also, which I don't, I want to be clear about this. I don't think this is a problem with the skill itself. I think this is maybe a problem with how um, we used it at Phoenix House. But it was kind of used as like this get out of jail free card in a sense of hmm. like, I mean, yes, they were in jail, quote unquote, for 24 hours. But it was kind <laughs> of like, okay, now do your behavior chain analysis and then you get to, you know, come back and that kind of a thing. Now, sometimes the girls, maybe about 10 to 20% of the time, they would actually think about this. They would actually genuinely show interest in these steps. And you could tell that they actually were thinking about it. And other times, most of the time, they were just kind of going through the motions of this skill and they mm. weren't really thinking mm -hmm. about it critically. And so they would do this skill, and then, you know, 48 hours later, the same problem behavior happens. <laughs> so what did they really get out of it? They didn't get much. And again, I don't think that's a problem with the skill itself, because I think if you actually really do this work, this can be really helpful. But you've got to really want to do these steps. Otherwise, you're not going to get much out of it. Which, yeah. if we're honest, is true of anything with DBT or really anything with life if we want to get super broad. Like, you have to actually put forth the time and the effort to get the results that you want. If you're just going to go through the motions and give the bare minimum, you're not going to get as much out of that experience. And I saw that a lot <laughs> with the girls that I worked with at Phoenix House. I saw kind of the bare minimum with doing this skill, filling in the blanks on the worksheet that we had. Um, and sometimes it did not lead to a whole lot of changes happening for them. Um, which is maybe a cautionary tale as we do start going through these steps of like, if you're going to use this skill, give yourself the time and space to do it. Because even with the girls doing it bare minimum, this would typically take at least 15 minutes. But I think if you're really going to actively think about each of these steps, I mean, set aside, I mean, it's going to be hour? for everyone. I was going to say, yeah, at, at yeah. least 30 minutes, if not an hour, um, to do this. This takes time. This takes a lot of effort. Um, so it's because of that that, you know, some of the other DBT skills don't take as much time. They're a little more accessible. They're a little easier to do. Um, 
and some of them as we've put it in the past some of them more are you know ones where you're using your brain more than anything else like check mm -hmm. the facts and that kind of a thing um or pros and cons that's another really like thinking skill and then some are more body-based skills well behavior chain analysis is totally thinking <laughs> straight through <laughs> um so it's just important that you you know know up front before you do this skill this is a pretty time intensive skill and it's going to take you being really honest with yourself um to do all of the steps and to really look at this problem behavior whatever the problem behavior is for you again i think that's what happened a lot at phoenix houses the girls didn't really see anything wrong with their problem behavior they knew mm -hmm. that if they wanted to watch the movie we were watching that night this doing this worksheet was something they needed to do to get there but did they really think that what they did a couple days ago was um something that they i don't know we could say had had regret about or wish they had done differently no not always <laughs> <laughs> most of the time not um and then again they were more likely to repeat it so you got to be ready to do this skill and to really take a look at all of this with all the different steps that we're going to be talking about and, and there's there's eight steps there's there's quite a few so um to really just be ready to take a look at things for yourself and to have that desire and that motivation to want to do something different those are key prerequisites i would say like that stuff has to be in place before you start working through these steps um or it isn't gonna work <laughs> so <laughs> i think that's about all i have to say about it um kate you know as as you mentioned right before i started talking that this isn't a this is not a skill that kate and i teach in our groups so this isn't you know a skill that either of us have touched on in a while maybe you learned it in your program when you were going when i was DT. 19 yeah right <laughs> um but any thoughts on um what i just said or anything you want to tack on no i like the idea that you want to i don't know you have to bring a lot of intentionality to this one i think it's yeah. sort of a summary of what i was hearing you say mm -hmm. like some of the stuff like i don't know tip or some of the self-soothing stuff like you don't have to have a lot of commitment mm -hmm. for them to be effective and they're like right? feel good well tip is maybe not a feel good skill yeah, so yeah. certainly is if like that's nice you know <laughs> this might not feel nice <laughs> to do no. a behavior chain analysis yeah. right so yeah. and, and if you're not willing and able to look at what you've done honestly then that's also not gonna be very helpful for it so mm -hmm. no i like it i think it just makes a lot of sense from what i've read of it so yeah all right, so let's get into the the steps of it. <laughs> oh, excuse me, of course I yawn. Also, I totally, I don't know, maybe it won't show up, but Jin is on my lap, as we were mentioning earlier, and his tail has, like, <laughs> it's Oh, well, I can't hear it on my end, so on. that's good. I'm waiting for, like, a, like, when we actually put this episode out there for, like, thwap, thwap. <laughs> his tail hitting the chair i so, see his ear sticking up on your yeah, screen <laughs> if this is if this is a very ginny episode uh <laughs> i apologize in advance but he's it is honestly us too <laughs> and he's missed me being in this chair because this is his place where he gets time with his mama yeah is to sit in this chair and he's way more annoying sitting outside the door howling so yeah, we don't want that i think the tail noises are less annoying <laughs> than you know every two and a half seconds uh all right so first things first the first step in chain analysis is to describe the problem behavior right what is the thing right this can be i mean gosh i think we sort of said it but really anything right just anything you would not like to be doing um when under you know from when you're triggered i guess would be a way to put it so it lists things like overeating drinking like being abusive to people throwing stuff um dissociating self-harm right like all sorts of different things but when you're doing this there's some things you want to make sure you're paying attention to when you're describing the behavior um first of all be very specific and very detailed right no vagary no i I don't know i'm so because of my experience with tbt was all around my own stuff when i was 19 i think about it in terms of self-harm right but so instead of saying something like don't do the thing or you know i hurt myself or something right like you want to mm -hmm. be actually 
detailed and specific about what really happened. So that means things like identifying exactly what you did, what you said, what you thought or felt, and sometimes maybe like what did you not do, right? Like didn't sit and talk it out with someone or, you know, didn't think about the fact that I couldn't go and pick up my kid from school if I drank right now or, right? Like, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at that and you kind of want to make sure you're taking time to look at all of them when you're answering this question. Um, you also want to do things like you want to describe the intensity of the behavior and the other characteristics of the behavior that are important. Um, you know, there's a difference maybe between, I don't know, self-harming for five minutes and self-harming for an hour. Right? Like not all, not all intensities are, are equal. So not just describe what the behavior was, but like how intensely you engaged in it. Um, and also you want to look at, I don't know how I want to put that, like, oh, there you go. I like how they say this. Describe the problem behavior in enough detail that an actor in a play or movie could recreate the behavior exactly, right? I think, I don't know, uh, reading this over and talking about it with Michelle earlier, I would say that, um, thematically through this whole process is this idea of excruciating detail. Excruciating detail. It even <laughs> says that in writing for it one does. of the steps. <laughs> yeah, yes. step four, it uses that term excruciating detail. Yep. <laughs> so, right, so this is just obnoxious, like, if no one, no one you were ever talking to would ever want you to describe anything this much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is not conversational, right? This is like you're writing, I think they even say this too later, like you're writing a screenplay, right? You're writing directions for a stage play so that someone can do exactly what you did based on what you wrote. So, um, and then the last thing that it has here is if the behavior is something that you didn't do, ask yourself whether you didn't know you needed to do it, um, you forgot it and, you know, it didn't come into your mind at the time, whether you put it off, um, when you rejected doing it, um, or was it, or, or if you were willful and rejected it. So those are the, those are some of the things to think about when you're analyzing what you're, what you didn't do. Like, all right, so you didn't do a good thing, but why? <laughs> I think is what that whole mm -hmm. part of that step boils down to is why did you not do maybe the less problematic thing or something that could have prevented the problematic behavior and things like that. So mm -hmm. anything to add to that, Michelle? Um, I think the only thing that I would add is that we all have a problem behavior, at least one. <laughs> Minimum. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> um, you know, right? Because, and as you were mentioning at the beginning, Kate, which I'm really glad that you said this, you know, DBT was designed for some of the, yeah. I guess you could say more extreme problem behaviors that we think about. But this this could range um, oh, yeah. very widely. So if you're already thinking like, oh, I don't have a problem behavior, <laughs> think again, listener. Yeah, something like, I, I tend to snap at my partner if I've had a stressful uh -huh. day at work. Yeah. Right? Like, it doesn't have to be anything, I don't know, like you said, huge mm -hmm. or intense. Yeah. And or that's, extreme. I think the reason why I thought about it was because of the did not do idea also. Oh, right? Yeah, so maybe it's sense. like your problem behavior is that you struggle to pay your bills on time. Like, that's a thing that you're not doing <laughs> yeah like you're not paying your bills on time um or you did not eat healthy foods or i don't know it, it could be so many things but there can really yeah be a wide spectrum here so to just think about it for yourself so yeah and don't mind me if you hear some sounds i'm now letting the master of the house out of the room so, oh well, that's perfect while you hit your talk next about step. number two <laughs> <laughs> yeah great um, so then basically, I mean, yeah, the first step, like Kate was talking about, is you need to um, identify what the problem behavior is. But then when we really get into the chain analysis piece of it, the whole reason why you're doing the chain analysis is because this problem behavior happened. You did that thing that is problematic, or you did not do <laughs> something, yeah. and that is problematic. So where you really want to then go is to describe the specific prompting event that started the whole chain of behavior. The way that I like to think about this um, is thinking about a trigger. Now, again, also, I think sometimes we think triggers are something big, something that is tangible, 
objective <laughs> outside of ourselves in the environment. Like that's, that's what a trigger is. Triggers can be far more sneaky. Um, triggers can be, which we also touched on this a little bit in the Ride the Wave episode, but triggers can be memories, thoughts, um, things like that. Things that just come into our mind <laughs> can um, be part of the prompting event. So what they say on the worksheet is um, always begin with some event in your environment, even if it doesn't seem to that the environmental event caused the problem behavior. Um, and so, yeah, it can be very subtle and it's really just taking it back as far as we can to the beginning. Sometimes this could even be that if something like the problem behavior itself happens, say that evening, but the prompting event could have happened that morning. <laughs> that could happen sometimes. Sometimes they the really... day before, I imagine. Yeah, right. exactly. Sometimes they come really close together. Sometimes they come really far apart. How much space and time passes between the prompting event and when you actually do the problem behavior the Kate was just talking about. Um, but some questions you can ask yourself here are, you know, what exact event precipitated the start of the chain reaction? Kind of like we were just saying. Um, when did the sequence of events that led to the problem behavior begin and when did the problem start? Um, what was going on right before the thought of or impulse for the problem behavior occurred? So there's also sometimes if we do think about it back as like what we were talking about in the Ride the Wave episode. So the problem behavior is the peak, right? Um, mm -hmm. We reach this peak and this problem behavior happens. And of course, as we were talking about with Ride the Wave, that's about getting through and choosing a different path instead of the problem behavior when you're at that peak and how hard that can be. Um, but this really is getting at, you know, it, was there something right before the problem behavior that kind of tipped it for you to where you got to that peak? And just basically, you know, some, something happened that started that escalation process too that we were talking about, and that could have been far before. Um, what were you doing, thinking, feeling, or imagining at that time? And why did the prompt behavior happen on that day instead of the day before? I think that's interesting, but it can help a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, especially when sometimes all of our days can feel about the same. Like, you know, you might get up and go to work five days a week, come home from work or go in another room if you're working virtually, eat dinner, like sit on the couch, watch TV, like, <laughs> you know, our days might more or less feel the same. Well, what was different about this day when I did this thing than the day before when I didn't do that thing? You know, what happened? So ultimately with this second step, it's just about kind of being a, a detective of sorts and just trying to really do some digging and getting curious mm -hmm. about where did things actually begin? Where was the source of me being triggered that eventually, even if a lot of time passed, that eventually led up to the problem behavior? What was the root of it is what we're trying to, to get at there. Um, any other thoughts on that, Kate? <sighs> Gosh, I like the idea, you know, making sure that the, oh, I guess at the very beginning, I was just thinking like there are different ways that we sometimes use the word trigger. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I'm one of those picky people that hates people saying, I was so triggered. I'm like, <laughs> like nah. yeah, mm, you weren't. But I think in this one, we're using it in a more literal sense, not like in the like psychology term sense, yeah. but just, I like how they say prompting event, right? Like, mm -hmm. so it's like, it, it, it's not necessarily quote unquote, a trigger, but mm -hmm. is a thing that triggered something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if you're scanning through your memories and looking for a trigger and you're like me and have a sort of narrower definition mm -hmm. of what a trigger is, you may not find it, right? Yeah. So just look for, you know, not a trigger, but a thing that's triggered. <laughs> yeah, 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 because <laughs> totally. The word trigger brings to mind anyways, for me, it brings to mind like, well, something major must have happened. Or relating to a past thing, like a trigger is something yeah. that it, like uh, brings up your trauma. Mm -hmm. And like we were talking about, like, sure, this may have been designed for people with trauma or with really extreme mm -hmm. problem behaviors. But if you're someone who's on the mild side of things with the behavior in and of itself, yeah. you probably don't have a trigger in that sense mm -hmm. because you may not have a trauma to be triggered. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. <laughs> so exactly. you may just not find it if you're looking at it in those terms, I guess is what I was thinking. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It could be very much just like, well, somebody said some, you know, someone said something to you. 
Yep. The maybe at the moment didn't feel like any kind of a big thing. Deal. Yeah. But then later on, like you're thinking about it, or you know, we're we're gonna get there in a moment. But yeah, a, a prompting event can truly be anything, and yeah, is not always something huge. <laughs> I wouldn't. I'm not sure this is true, but I would say on average, the more mild your problem behavior, probably the more mild the triggering prompting event is. Um. Do you think? I actually would disagree with that because, oh. I mean, it depends. But I think about, like, for, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of, um, like, an example. Um, but like, I was thinking, for, like, the snapping at the person, like, snapping at your spouse when you have a stressful day at work. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I mean, it's going to, it's going to be different for everybody, right? You know, what might oh, sure. feel major for one person might feel very minor or no big deal for another. But I think it's something where even if it's a big problem behavior, it doesn't take much to get there sometimes. Oh, sure. Like, Maybe I think I'm thinking it goes one way and not the other. Like if you have a mild behavior, it is more likely to have a mild trigger, but it doesn't mean that the big behavior has to have a big trigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, yes. Yes. I totally get what you're saying there because like Luke was talking about this um, in the episode about addiction of like when you're struggling with addiction, any, it, it gets to this point where any All the time, vulnerability is the thing I'm going to talk about next. Right? True. Yes. We are going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, but like any time you tend to feel anything or anytime something starts going wrong in your day or something throws you off, it's like, well, I'll just go use, <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. just go drink. Um, and it could be like, uh, oh, you know, I'm, I, I was stuck in traffic on my way home and the traffic just got me really irritated. So then I come home and then I'm drinking. Well, is the traffic like a big prompting event? Eh, I don't know. It, to me, that's a pretty minor one. Mm -hmm. Um, but it could still lead to that, uh, you know, more destructive yeah. sort of behavior. Yeah, it, it could lead to a be to a problem behavior that could have some pretty bad consequences, um, yeah. even if it doesn't take as much to get there. And from an addiction standpoint, which again, not all of these problem behaviors are going to be addictive behaviors, like we were talking about. For some people, it might look that way. For a lot of people, it's not. Um, but that if the problem behavior you're struggling with is something that you are also developing an addiction towards or already are addicted to, then that prompting event, it probably doesn't have to be yeah. much to get you to then go do that thing. Um, but yeah, I like that we are talking about it in the sense of, <laughs> you know, again, like sometimes it's a mild prompting event that can lead to a big behavior <laughs> or a mm -hmm. mild prompting event leading to a mild behavior or a big prompt. It's probably not going to be that a big prompting event leads to a mild behavior. That's that was the only thing the I was to trying to say, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So the next step is to describe what they call vulnerability factors happening before the problem. Uh, prompting event. We're taking blah, about blah, 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 blah. I know, right? It is funny because you start at the end and go back to the beginning, mm -hmm. more or less, it seems like in a lot of ways, or it's like end, beginning, middle. I don't know. It's a weird sort of yeah. order, but I do get it. It's It does help you. It's sensible in a way of thinking about it, even mm -hmm. if it's weird on a timeline. Um, so vulnerability factors, these are, I don't know, things that made you more vulnerable to reacting to whatever the prompting event was. Right. So um, as we were talking about uh, at the very beginning, right, this doesn't technically reference any DBT skills. But what both Michelle and I thought of immediately when we we looked at this step was please. Right. Those because um, all of those things make us more vulnerable emotionally. Right. Are we dealing with physical illness? Are we on drugs or alcohol or misusing prescription drugs? Have we are we overly tired? Have we been having. I don't know, a severe or even moderate emotional issue is life just super stressful have you been eating poorly have we right like so just what things might have worn down your capacity to handle shit um i think is really what this boils down to right is there stuff in your environment that you're already having to sort of i don't know for lack of a better way of thinking of it fend off that means you don't have much left of emotional or mental resources you know for yourself um you know, is you, are you, is you, are you <laughs> injured? There we go. Is you injured? <laughs> is you injured? Ah, <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, have you been eating like crap? Have you been, um, you know, are you depressed? Or, you know, right before the prompting event, were you in the midst of some sort of intense emotion for some other reason, right? So all of these things uh, can make you more likely to be reactive, I guess is how I would think of it, um, which might be one of the ways that one of those more, I don't know, objectively mild seeming prompting events might lead to bigger behaviors. Yeah. Um, and this, again, this is trying to be very specific, right? I, don't, I think it's a, I think the word specific shows up in maybe every literally step. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Almost, yeah. <laughs> At least these first three. It's really important. Yes, by the specific problem and the specific prompting event, the specific vulnerability factors. Right? So don't, I don't know. Another word I would apply to this whole thing is thorough. Yeah. Right? They really want you to be thorough. So maybe there's multiple things, right? I, I, it doesn't have to be just, I was tired. Maybe it's I was tired and hung over from the night before and I just had a big fight with my spouse. So I was really angry and I have the flu. <laughs> At that point, mm -hmm. you're probably really vulnerable. Um, and so, you know, just look at those things. I also, I don't know, I, it doesn't mention this at all, but I would hope that this is a stage in the process that might invite whoever's going through this to be a little bit more compassionate to themselves. Um, that maybe this can help them be like, oh, maybe that's why I reacted so strongly to this thing. Mm -hmm. um, because I, it is my belief, I think Michelle was talking, saying, echoing the same idea when we were talking before recording, but you know, however you behave makes sense if you look at and include enough information when you're looking at it. So I think this, is, this step is one of those places where you can really dive into helping you know, to making sense to yourself that sounds like a weird sense does that make sense michelle no yeah that does so just like it can it can help you dig deeper to figure out what's what's going on under the surface that might have led to you then having this problem behavior down the line yeah and ideally with a bit of bit of compassion mm -hmm. yep yeah um the only thing that I'll say, because now that I'm looking at it again, right, we looked at it initially. We're like, oh, okay, they're talking about please, you know, simple. Yeah. Um, man, yeah. And it came up a little bit as you were talking, too. This is so much more than just please. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, yes, look at your please stuff. And also, like. <laughs> and also. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I just think about right now, we're in, we're in a pandemic. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> Wait, what's, what's the, one of the things they say, external... Yeah, they say stressful events in the environment. Environment, there we go, yeah. And they say either positive or negative, right? Um, because... Oh, good point. I didn't emphasize that at all, the positive part. Yeah, which is so interesting, but it but it's true, right? You can have something really positive happening in your life, and it may also bring stress. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I think about that just recently, personally, with um, my husband and I going through our home renovation, Oof. Um, which we've been going through for a couple months, and thankfully we're at the tail end of it now, <laughs> which feels good. There's just touch-up stuff to do from here. Um, but did that make both of us more vulnerable to, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it did. Um, just having, you know little things like you know our refrigerator in our living room for two weeks and you know whatever it was just it, it there can be things going on in your environment that are stressors that may not always be in the front of your mind that you may not be con consciously thinking about all the time but that's exactly what this is getting at with the vulnerability factors is like what's in the background what are you not noticing mm -hmm. what flies under your radar a lot of the times that actually is contributing to your stress building up. <laughs> um, what What's going on back there? And, um, you know, yeah, just going through everything with COVID, uh, we're all more vulnerable right now <laughs> mm -hmm. because of that. Um, and, you know, the holidays are coming up and there's just a lot right now that may be running in the background of our minds that make us more vulnerable. So... Yeah, it's really just asking us to dig deeper. I really like that it talks about this as mm -hmm. looking at these factors. Yeah. Okay, cool. On to step four? On to step four. All right, we're halfway. 
<laughs> okay, and ooh, uh, yeah, step four. Step four is. <laughs> I'm glad you get this one. I mean, <laughs> well, I'm glad you get number seven. So there we go. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so step step four is big. Um, so step four may arguably take you the most time when you're doing this because this is where the chain part of behavior chain analysis comes in um because it says this is where it says excruciating detail describe in excruciating detail the chain of events that led to the problem behavior so we were talking about in step two there's a prompting event sometimes that happens seconds before the problem behavior sometimes that happens hours <laughs> or even a day or two before the problem behavior there's a prompting event that happens um and then there's stuff that happens in between the problem event and of the problem event the prompting event <laughs> and the problem <laughs> behavior oh man i did that um, earlier too i bet it's not the last time we do it <laughs> that's probably not the last time we do it but there's there's stuff that happens um and <laughs> The stuff can sometimes be literal things, right? So this could be, I'm trying to come up with a random example off the top of my head, but this could be that you were, say, sitting in traffic, getting frustrated on your way home. That's maybe a vulnerability factor there. <laughs> you walk in the house and uh, your partner says something like, what do you want to do for dinner tonight? And there's your prompting event because you don't know what to do for dinner tonight. And why are they asking you the minute that you walk in the door? Um, and also maybe your partner seems kind of stressed out and you walk in and the house is kind of messy and you and your partner maybe have an exchange. You go back and forth. You each say a couple things. Maybe you get into an argument about what to do for dinner. Um, maybe your partner eventually makes dinner, but then after dinner, you're so fed up at this point that then you go and have a drink. Okay. That's my super generic chain of events. <laughs> um, but a lot of stuff happened there. A lot of things were said between you and your partner. Each of you maybe did some things, right? Your partner maybe went and started dinner. Maybe while they were doing that, you sat on the couch and looked at your phone or whatever it was. But there were probably some actions, some things that were said, and also really key here, some things that you were thinking and some emotions that you were feeling. And these are all things that were occurring over this span of time. Even mm -hmm. if it was only, I don't know, a half hour. <laughs> a lot happened. And with this step number four, what you are going to do, this is where, as Kate referenced earlier, it's like writing a screenplay or a script. You are going to write it out everything that happened as best as you can remember it you can even if you want to do this as steps step number one i come inside step number two my partner says to me what do you want for dinner step number three i say back i don't know what to do for dinner why don't you come up with dinner well <laughs> feeling like something four. right at that point where like would you include in that step like I say this to my partner where I feel frustrated. my shoulders yeah. clench mm -hmm. and emotionally notice that I was, I don't know, frustrated and, I don't know, yep. hurt or whatever. Yep. Exactly. If you're thinking of it like a play or like a script, if you have actually read a play or a script, um, if you have an acting background or some <laughs> experience there, they have those notes all along the way of you know what tone of voice as kate was just mentioning what what do you do with your body <laughs> you know do you walk across the room do you point your finger do you, you know all of those details are in there so that it's not just two people standing speaking in a monotone <laughs> tone of voice to each other because that's not what's actually happening um so you are writing down in order with as much detail as you can everything that occurred between the prompting event and the problem behavior. Now, if you're like, well, my prompting event happened and then, because this does happen sometimes, and then, you know, five seconds later, I was doing the problem behavior, I don't care. There are, <laughs> there's something that happened there. <laughs> something you did with your body, something that you thought, something that you felt, 
there was something that happened there. You can probably get in minimum at least three steps in this the chain like of events. This is like thin slices, right? Slice it thinner. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. This is very thin slices. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Get in. Get detailed. Right. It says excruciating detail. Get very detailed. <laughs> and some people might have this question of like, well, like, okay, but honestly, Kate and Michelle, like, how detailed? At what point do I call this quits? Um, I mean, that's up to you. <laughs> um, but but I really think that there is some benefit in doing this. Um, because we're gonna talk about it a little bit in a couple couple more steps down the line. Then what do you do um <laughs> from there? But I mean, yeah, write it out. If you get a page or two of material here, you're on point. Um so it's it's going to take time. It's going to be really painfully detailed. And that means you're doing it correctly. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, things you want to add on there, Kate? I like your slice it thinner idea. That's that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, I don't because, you know, there's always more happening in us that we and or in our environment than we're really paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Um Gosh, I don't think so. We talked about the body sensations because I think that one's important. We don't always notice yes. that. That's a thing we definitely don't pay too much. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with the excruciating detail, I think, I don't know, you were talking about like steps, but it almost might work to, I don't even know how you would actually write this down. It might require different sheets, but like do the broad strokes first mm. and then be like, all right, between these two broad strokes, what was there mm -hmm. and like you just keep sort of adding things between until you literally can't think of anything yeah. else anymore yeah. that's totally a way you could approach it um because it could be really hard in one first pass to get to all get of everything. this little tiny detail mm -hmm. so it might be you know first just the big broad things that happened mm -hmm. and then smaller and then smaller and mm -hmm. smaller until you're like, I'm pretty sure that's literally every thought feeling or action I made in that minute amount of time. <laughs> yeah, you might start with writing out actions. That tends to be, I mean, not for everyone, but maybe for, I would say, the majority of people, that's easier. Yeah. These are the actions. This is what happened. And then, yeah, layering on, oh, this is what I was thinking. Oh, this is what I was feeling emotionally. Oh, this is how my body felt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you then you have it all in depth. So yeah, it might take a couple different drafts um, and a couple rewrites to really get it. Get there. Get it down. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but this is, this is a, a, That's a nitty gritty chunk of what you're yep. doing here. Step number four. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. Take your time with it. So yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so step five is describe the consequences of the problem behavior. So I'm going to very briefly stand on a soapbox um because i hate what people have done to the poor word consequences the, the damn thing just means things that happened because of something else <laughs> like you know that very parental like there will be consequences young lady you know sort of thing well yeah we live in a world with cause and effect so of course there will be things that happen because i did a thing anyway all right there's my soapbox but that actually is relevant because consequences don't have to be negative right so i think if you come at this step looking at consequences the word consequences kind of the way our social schema does which is just negative things right just bad things then you're gonna miss plausibly not necessarily but might plausibly miss part of the consequences um as how do i put this we probably all engage no not probably we literally all have reasons for doing stuff right mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know we wouldn't engage in these problem behaviors if there wasn't something that at least in the moment felt positive about it right and so i think that to be really vulnerable and really honest and really thorough there's that word again with this step is you need to be paying attention to all of the consequences right be they good bad or ugly Mm -hmm. um, right. So this can be external consequences. So how did uh, other people react to what you did either right in that moment or later? Um, if what you did was something literally destructive, right? What are the consequences? Like I broke my television, right? So now I don't have a TV, right? Mm -hmm. Would be a consequence that it could be, you know, tangible 
uh, consequences to what you did. Um, what about you? How did you feel like emotionally and mentally right after doing the behavior or further away from the behavior, which might be very different things? Um, you know, your immediate feelings about it and your feelings several hours later. Um, and what effect did the behavior have on you or your environment? So, you know, in, I, you know, because it's my personal experience thing, I come back to a lot of self-harm, right? So it might be something like, you know, now I can't wear short sleeves without people freaking out. Um, or now I need medical attention or now I, you know, like, or I got blood on this thing, whatever, right? Like, so like, what are the, what are the consequences to like, you're literal to yourself, um, on a sort of tangible basis. So you want to look at yourself on more of a emotional, mental, uh, I don't know what their lens, um, and also look at yourself and your environment in a sort of tangible objective lens, uh, and then look at the other people in your environment. Um, obviously, you can't know everything about the people in your environment, so you can't know necessarily what they were thinking, so be a little careful there that you don't go a little mind reedy um, inappropriately, but if they yelled at you, that's, you know, an externally objective, objective thing, not objectionable, though, maybe. Um, <laughs> Right. So that uh, this is just really, really look at what happened because of the behavior. You know, it uses the word consequences, which people tend to think of as only negative, but just what happened because I did this thing. Um, and again, just trying to be as specific and thorough as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, anything to add to that one, Michelle? No. That one seems pretty, more, yeah. one of the more simple ones. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I think you described it perfectly and hit on all the different components of okay. how consequences can look. So, yeah. All right, moving on to step number six. So it's funny because um, step number four and step number six, <laughs> they, they, go, they go together a little bit. Um, I think it's really important that they put in step number five. Actually, I think step number five is a really important step here to think about the consequences, but we're kind of going to go back to what you were doing in number four <laughs> for a moment, where you were writing out that script you know, that description of what happened, however you chose to do it, whether it was in bullet points or paragraph form or however, however you described it, we're going back to that. And basically what they want you to do, they say circle each link where if you had done something different, you would have avoided the problem behavior. So you may have written out, right, a lot, <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. three pages of material. And now as you look back over it, where were those key spots kind of like where were the forks in the road mm. of like right you made one choice because we are making choices at all the time all the time whether we are aware of it or not as kate was saying there's always cause and effect um so where were those moments where it's like ah i see how i chose that fork in the road <laughs> and maybe i could have chosen a different path or done yeah. something differently you know okay so you know, my partner asked me, well, you know, what should we make for dinner? And, you know, I, you know, raised my voice and said, you know, I don't know, figure it out. Well, maybe what I could have done is said, um, I'm not ready to think about dinner yet. Can you give me 10 minutes just to unwind or something? You know, so there were, there are these key points. Um, and sometimes you, depending again on how, how much you wrote down for step number four, maybe you have, you can see about, you know, I don't even know how many, it's gonna be so unique to everyone. There's gonna be probably at least one key point. Um, you may have many key points where it's like, oh, I could have done something different there. I could have done something different there. <laughs> and the key points don't always have to be just in your actions. This can be, Oh, that's where I noticed myself feeling frustrated, you know, or that's where I started to think, God, they're always late, you know, or so the key points can be anything that you wrote down. Um, actually, sometimes I would argue that our key points really are our internal experience, sometimes more than what's happening externally, um, that those are things to hone in on because we're probably making choices about our actions based off of our thoughts and emotions. So noticing where were the key points. Um, 
And then you get to ask yourself, <laughs> what would I have done differently? Um, so this is where it can become helpful to already have a DBT background going through this. This can be helpful to think about it in the context of DBT. Oh, I could have paused and checked the facts. <laughs> I could have gone and done some self-soothing. I could have, you know, practiced some radical acceptance right there. I could have done been dear more man. Willing. I could have <laughs> dear man, right? Um, you know, by this point in the podcast, if you've been listening, you have these skills under your belt. So you can think about it in terms of DBT skills. What skills could I have used that might have had a different outcome at each of these points? Um, even if you have no DBT skills, though. Um, and as Kate puts it, my superpower is making everything a DBT skill, which is true. <laughs> is so true. even with that person, you know, that I'm describing in this hypothetical scenario of maybe how they could have just been like, hey, just let me sit down for 10 minutes and then can we talk about dinner? Um, hey, that's using stop. You know, <laughs> like, um, even if they don't realize that or know what stop <laughs> is, they're using stop. Um, if you're making a decision to... Um, yeah, try to like, okay, I was, yeah, I, I started yelling. And then maybe what I could have done instead is um, I could have lowered my voice or I could have just tried to listen to what the other person was saying. Ah, you're using some give, you know, so you're probably using DBT skills, whether you know it or not. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah, so basically step six breaks into two different parts. The first part is to identify those really important moments where you could have made a different choice and then to identify what that other choice would have been that might have been more effective than what actually happened at the moment. Again, I think it's really, really, really important here to make sure that you are not invalidating your emotions. Um, so even if the key moment was like, ha, ah, then I started feeling pissed. Um, and if that's the key moment, okay. Pissed isn't bad. Pissed isn't wrong. Okay, so you felt really pissed off. And then what could you have done with that mm -hmm. <laughs> that would have been different? Like, yes, that's an important part of the plot <laughs> where things take a turn. Um, and what, what could you have done with that? Because sometimes what happens, I think, in these scenarios is that we bottle um, we don't do anything with our emotions. We pretend we're not feeling what we're feeling sometimes, um, or maybe I'm just speaking personally, and <laughs> then it comes out later, and that's why you get to that place where problem behavior is happening, because you didn't intervene earlier when you first started feeling that way. You know, you started feeling that emotion, and then it built, and it grew, and it got to a level 10, rather than when it was at a 4, saying, oh, <laughs> I'm recognizing... <laughs> what I'm feeling. And so let me, you know, make a different decision here so that I can attend to that and take care of myself. Um, that kind of an idea. So anything else you would say about this step number six? No, I don't think so. I think you covered what I would think of. Um, I'm glad you brought in the, like, don't, shame yourself if possible don't invalidate yourself as possible because i do think that this i don't know other than just the sheer uh, intellectual rigor mm -hmm. uh that might make this difficult yeah um i think that it could be really easy to use this this school this tool <laughs> to uh berate yourself Right mm -hmm. to put yourself down to be like, look, I fucked up there and there and uh, there and yeah. there and there and look, I had all of these opportunities to just do something different and I didn't. Right, I fucked up the choice at every single turn. Right, like, <laughs> I mean, if you're not careful mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're maybe not in a great headspace for coming at this particular skill, um, it could fuck you up. Um, so, right, this is not, ideally, this is not about self-invalidation or self-berating, right? This is about honesty and self-compassion, right? If you're, if you're shaming yourself, you're also probably not doing the, literally, you're not doing the skill right, right? Because shame mm -hmm. makes us not look at things so honestly, makes us not 
be able to dive into things as well, right? So the only thing I would say is sort of put that warning out there, like the, especially this, like, where could you have done it better? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it could really easily slip into shitting on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so go way back to the vulnerabilities thing. Remember that there are reasons. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right? And try and bring bring some self-kindness. Yeah, absolutely. And self-compassion into it. Yeah. And like our neural pathways run deep, <laughs> you know? So if, if in this scenario with, you know, a, par a, a couple arguing about dinner um, and then one person eventually like drinking at the end of the night because of it, um, you know, maybe you've been in this relationship for 18 years. And maybe <laughs> there's a long history of just like, this is how the two of you kind of speak to each other. And this is just what you guys know. And so even if you can see, ah, oh, I could have done it differently there. Um, sure. And also like, it takes Doesn't mean it's so, easy. <laughs> yeah. Like it takes so much work for us to do things differently. It takes so much effort and time to learn and actually get comfortable with doing new skills. And that's why with behavior chain analysis, it, it really is a whole lot of thinking. <laughs> As you were saying, Kate, like this this is this is pretty laborious, just yes. thinking wise. Um because you know you can you can know. You can know <laughs> that, oh yeah, you know, huh, yeah, yelling at my partner, not not the best route. And yet if that's what you've been doing for 18 years, that is not gonna be changing overnight. Yep. Um, you are starting to take steps to change that and to be kind to yourself when you do fuck it up and to be kind to yourself when, <laughs> you know, it takes the next, you know, however many times or however many months to actually then do the different thing. That's, I think, the beauty of this skill for as in intensive as it is, is like this really helps you clearly see um, and be intentional about what you want to do different. Kind of gives um, you a roadmap, maybe. Yeah, exactly. It gives it gives you a roadmap. It gives you some guidance so that even if you're used to, if we go with that analogy, if you're used to driving one route all the time and now you're going someplace new that you've never been and you don't really know how to get there, you're just following <laughs> directions and hope you get there. Well, having directions helps rather than us just leaving our house and being like, all right, I think I know where I'm going. I don't really know, but let me, <laughs> let me see if I get there. Then you get lost, right? Having directions helps. Um, having some intentionality makes it more likely that you are going to make a different choice next time, even if you didn't this time around. And you probably have a good reason why you didn't this time around because this, this stuff can be so new um, when there's this totally other way of moving through the world that you've maybe been doing for a long, long time. <laughs> So mm -hmm. it's okay. Be patient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right. Seven. The one yeah. you're glad I have. <laughs> yes. Because it gives you nothing. <laughs> it gives me nothing. Uh, so what the actual step is, is describe in detail a prevention strategy for how you could have kept the chain from starting by reducing your vulnerability to the chain. A the weird end fucking sentence yep the end uh bye no uh <laughs> um also uh while we're talking about sounds i just want to say because i my surgery i'm also shifting around a lot today so i know those sounds do show up so i'm sorry everybody <laughs> all the chair noises um so remember way back to uh oh it has to be an odd number because i did it number step three three yep step three where we're talking about the vulnerability factors right about you know illness injury drugs or alcohol stressful environment you know emotional states things like that right this really ties back in to step three which means it's gonna be really de i think it depends you're not gonna be able to address probably everything for instance yeah. if one of the things that we probably i'm gonna say definitely all would if we're being really honest ought to put in our vulnerability as michelle mentioned when she was talking about it is the pandemic uh there's no pe prevention strategy for that one <laughs> yep i'm sorry it does suck yep right <laughs> so i, I do want to say that when you're doing this step be reasonable yeah there are gonna be some that yeah 
you can do something about. And there's going to be some that, yeah, you can't do anything about, right? So I just make sure you're looking at it in, with that sort of discernment so that you're not beating your head against a brick wall of impossibility. So assuming we have gone through all of the vulnerabilities and just sort of gently and with compassion for ourselves set to the side all the stuff we have no control over. <laughs> now we look at the stuff we do have some influence or some control over. And the way I understand this step is to be like, all right, are there either things I could do just generally like in life? Like, you know what? I really have been shit about my sleep. I, that is something that, you know, I don't know when it might cause something to happen or be part of my vulnerabilities, but if I reduce that on average, I'm going to be less reactive. So that's a thing I can tackle, right? Or maybe it's something that's much more specific. Uh, if we're doing um, Michelle's uh, example, there we go, Jesus Christ, uh, <laughs> the person coming home from work and the whole argument about dinner. Um, I guess that's not really a vulnerability. I was going to say, like, try and let your partner know that you've had a rough day at work mm -hmm. uh, and say, I need some time when we well, get home. Having, having a shitty job can make you vulnerable. <laughs> yes, that's true. And that's something you have <laughs> ish, uh, mm -hmm. control over depending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But right. So just look at them and see, is this something that I can address just sort of generally? Um, or is this something that, you know, this has come up repeatedly. It's a more specific issue. But if I, you know, if I look at this specific issue, how often does this come up and is there a vulnerability that I can change around this, right? Like, if I know I'm going into having a difficult conversation with a partner, maybe don't drink and beforehand. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I know that when I drink before trying to have a serious conversation, it's more likely to turn into a fight or something like that, right? Yeah. So this is about, I think, going back to step three, looking all of those vulnerabilities that you listed out, sorting them into two piles. Um, of can't do anything about that, could do something about these. Uh, and then see what you can do, right? Just for each of the things that is something you can influence, take a look at how you might influence that moving forward. Um, yeah, that's what I have. I really <laughs> like that. I, I like I like your addition of um, splitting the the things that make us vulnerable because i think when we were going through step three it became pretty clear almost probably at all times we're gonna have a couple different things that are making us vulnerable you yeah. know it's pretty common that you know oh, i didn't sleep well the night before i haven't eaten anything yet today. <laughs> like and then the overarching things yeah my my job sucks um i have this chronic back pain uh you know pandemic whatever um yeah. we probably have a couple um, most, if not all of us do. So yeah, to, d to divide them up and to try to create like a manageable, doable plan for one, uh, at least one, hopefully to, yeah. to help, you know, uh, I, sort of I, like, I, I mean, so I know that please did not encompass all of step mm -hmm. three, but something we said, every, well, say every time we teach, please is don't tackle all of these at the same time. Yes. Then you'll just fail at all of them. Probably. Yeah. Yep. Right. So I think also with this, once you've done that sorting, maybe write out a strategy for each of the things, but also don't expect yourself to implement all of them all at once because mm -hmm. you're not mm -hmm. gonna. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So if you set that up as your intention or standard or expectation of yourself, that failure, it will actually, it might become its own vulnerability, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. Don't, don't don't fuck yourself over more, right? Yeah. This is this is all meant to help you. <laughs> yeah. And it also might be one of those things, too, where, again, you may have, yeah, like multiple vulnerabilities and all of that. And you also, when you really look at this critically and in depth, you might be able to see and point at, ah, there was this one, though, on this day <laughs> yeah. that really impacted this situation. You know, yeah, maybe I didn't sleep well the night the night before, but I didn't sleep well all week. And so what was it about like this day or that kind of a thing? Ah, that day it was that I didn't really get a lunch break at work. Ah, okay. You know, so that's the thing. I remember that you mentioning that in one of the steps, like behavior. what's different today between mm -hmm. between today and yesterday? Why did it happen today and not yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. So even yeah. though that might be great for you to try to go to bed earlier, and that might help, you know, to try to really figure out also 
um, with this prompting event or with this problem behavior, what seems to most relate and be connected mm -hmm. with the things that maybe make you vulnerable because you might be able to potentially draw a pretty clear line of like oh yeah i can very much see how this influenced that <laughs> and these other things didn't really influence that as much as this thing did <laughs> yeah so i'm gonna work on that thing for this behavior yeah yep oh man we're at the end Yay! Well, i'm excited okay. it. <laughs> um so it says for step number eight after you do all of that describe what you are going to do to repair important or significant consequences of the problem behavior so this goes back to step five <laughs> they just all relate to these other steps at various points um but you know as kate was talking about with consequences there could this could look a wide variety of ways there may be some pretty tangible literal consequences you know i threw something it hit my tv now my tv is broken okay pretty tangible there may be interpersonal consequences if other people were involved in what happened um there could be just in internal consequences right feeling feeling shame feelings of regret um all of that it can run the gamut for what <laughs> consequences you might experience after all is said and done so um it breaks this down into um a couple different things it said what did you really harm and what was the negative consequence you can repair that's the first part it says to analyze that right behavior chain analysis um <laughs> I like, though, that it touches on what was the negative consequence you can repair? Because just as Kate was talking about with the prevention strategy and vulnerability stuff, some vulnerability stuff is within your control. Some vulnerability stuff is not within your control. Um, and it might actually be the same with this repair work. Um, there may be some things you can do to try to make this thing better. Also, like, we can't hit the rewind button on our life. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It doesn't exist. You know, we said what we said. We did what we did. Um, and sometimes what we say or do may have some lasting ramifications that we can only do so much about to make it better. So that can be important to look at and to have some kindness to yourself of, like, I'm going to do my best. And also, like, if maybe part of what happened was that you did something that really hurt someone that you're close to, well, if that person decides, um, even after you apologize and try to make amends and all that, if that person decides, hey, I'm still not ready to talk to you yet, well, there, there's not much more you can do unless they give you a sense of direction of like, well, you know, if you did X, Y, and Z, that might help. Um, so sometimes, you know, you can take steps to do some repair and those consequences may still linger, is I guess mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Um, the second part of this says, um, I mean, basically, it's very similar, actually. It says, look at the harm or distress you actually caused others and the harm or distress you caused yourself. Repair what you damaged. Um, it says, don't bring flowers to repair a window you broke. Fix the window! Exclamation point. Um, repair a betrayal of trust by being very trustworthy long enough to fit the betrayal rather than trying to fix it with love letters and constant apologies. Um, repair failure by succeeding, not by berating yourself. But what I really like about those examples is um, we try to fix things quickly a lot of times, <laughs> at least here in the United States. Um, and we try to fix things sometimes in a way that looks really good but doesn't actually get at the thing that really happened um it's like suit the repair to the damage yeah yeah exactly um and what what it's going to look like sometimes for repair work um is don't want to say doing all of this but but really what you've done up until this point in these steps is you've really taken stock of your actions 
um, what made you vulnerable, what you did, what happened, wh what other choices you could have made. So you do have a good roadmap, to use that word we touched on earlier, for how to make repairs. Because you can say to people in your life, or you can say to yourself, this is what I'm going to do next time because you did that in step six. You figured out what you would do next time. And in step seven, you figured out how you can hopefully, within reasonable control, <laughs> try to prevent that from happening again in the first place. So, you know, you've already done some good stuff and then really it's just communicating that. If there is something tangible that you can repair, you know, to do that, absolutely. And sometimes repair is a lot less tangible because sometimes repair means I try again next time. Sometimes repair means I use my gift skills um, to make an apology and to really hear how I hurt that other person. Um, so it, it looks like I think in a lot of cases, doing some soul searching, which you already did through a lot of these other steps. And now it's just putting the finishing touches on it of like when mm -hmm. I really think about what else I can do to try to make this situation better, either from what happened this time or just the intention I wanna set to make it better next time, uh, excuse me, then then you're doing this step number eight um, with trying to, to do some repair work. Yeah. Um, anything else for that one, Kate? I don't think so. All right. Yeah. So what's our homework, Michelle? Yeah, homework. <laughs> so we're going to post um, this. I, I say this every week. Uh, we're going to be posting this in the <laughs> Facebook group. <laughs> um, I'm going to try. I didn't do it before we started recording. But when I did this back at Phoenix House, there was a, there was a literal like fill in the blank worksheet that the girls did. I'm going to see if I can try to google and find that i'm sure something exists at least one worksheet for this um and people may have also come up with other various ones um but this like pros and cons this is a skill where you guys have got to write it down yeah this is not a just think about it skill that's not enough for this one it's more in depth than that so really um what I would say as homework is to, as best you can, m create some time and space to do this. And I would say, generally speaking, with doing a behavior chain analysis, you want to try to do it within 24 hours after the problem behavior, because otherwise our memory starts getting kind of fuzzy. And when oh, you get yeah. to step number four of writing things out, you're, you're going to start missing some stuff. Um, so... It's best to try to do this fairly soon after a uh, problem behavior happens. So if you happen to have a problem <laughs> behavior sometime this week, hey, then you get some really good in the moment practice with doing this skill because you could do it right after. But even if like you're aware, like as we were going through step one and you're like, yeah, I think I know what my, <laughs> what my biggest problem behavior is. I can see that for myself. You can practice this skill by thinking back and doing the steps for something that happened a while ago, whether it was, you know, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, even a couple years ago of like, well, I have this moment in my mind where I, who I remember when I did that. <laughs> and you can, and you can just get some practicing with going through and answering all the questions. So whether I find a worksheet or whether I don't, um, you know, that's your homework is to write out and answer all these questions. So um, you can type this, but I would recommend our brain processes things differently when we handwrite. So I would recommend grabbing a notebook, grabbing a pen, blocking out some time in your day and doing this for something, whether it's a recent thing that occurred or something from a while ago that happened, just to give you some, some practice. I like it. Yeah. Cool. All okay. right. Awkward self-promotion time. Do -do -do -do. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if we had a little sound effect there. Um, I anyway. know. You want that so bad. <laughs> I do. <laughs> 
So, first of all, a uh, giant thanks to all of our patrons on Patreon. We do not have a new person to shout out this week, but all of the appreciate all of the appreciation, there we go, still going to those folks who have signed up previously and are contributing and helping this podcast to keep going. Yeah. If you would like to be shouted out on one of our few Ooh. upcoming episodes uh, that are left. <laughs> we only got a couple more, you guys. Uh, feel free to go to patreon.com slash dbtandme. Um, we still have our Etsy shop, which just go to Etsy and search for DBT and me, give us a rate and review on Apple podcasts. And as always, we love to hear from you, um, at our email address, which is DBT and me podcast at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. Yay. Closing okay. moment. Closing moment. Oh, I need to stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. So, as always, start by just getting into a comfortable position, whatever that means for you right now. Maybe sitting, standing, laying down, walking around, whatever it is that feels good to you and your body right now. And if you feel safe and comfortable doing so, then go ahead and close your eyes. To begin with, we're just going to tune into our breathing. You don't have to breathe any more slowly or any more deeply than you are naturally. It's just about paying attention. Just about focusing in our awareness to the rhythms and the sensations of our breath. And letting that welcome us into the present moment and into our bodies. As we were talking about a little bit in this episode, shame can be a really hard thing to face with honesty and with compassion. And if we can't be honest with ourselves, it's gonna be really difficult to look at or work on any kind of problematic behavior. So today I'd like you to begin by thinking about what some major, for you, problem behavior may be, and think of a time that you engaged in it. Take a moment to really go back through your memory, and if at all possible, bring up a specific incident in which you engaged in this behavior. Once you have that in your mind, I'd like you to literally picture the you that engaged in that behavior. This could just be basically who you were and what you looked at at that time in your life. Depending on how recent or far away this memory is, this could be as detailed as what you were wearing at the time or you know, what your hair looked like. But no matter how detailed or non-detailed it is, the idea is simply to have in your imagination a manifestation of the you that engaged in that behavior during this incident. Once you've got that fairly firmly fixed in your mind's eye, I want you to look at yourself and as much as possible bring up a sense of tenderness and compassion. This might be helped by remembering what was going on in your life at this time. We talked a lot in this episode about the vulnerabilities and that's what I'd really love for you to focus on. What was going on internally? What was going on externally? that made this moment for your past self so difficult. Do your very best to remember what was making things hard? What was making you vulnerable? What was causing you to be more reactive than you might have otherwise been? You can either do this simply with thought or 
If you find that the manifestation of yourself changes in how they look or other details around them to match these, that's fine too. Maybe visual or simply felt. Just taking that time to really remember that no matter how disappointed you may have been in yourself at the time, no matter how ashamed you may have felt of the behavior you engaged in, no matter how disappointed or angry or frustrated, no matter what difficult or painful emotions you felt, remember that there were reasons Remember that if you take enough into account, your behavior made sense. And let that sense of being explainable help you have compassion and tenderness for your past self. Allow yourself to make sense. And fill yourself up with that that love and that understanding when we think that we behave for no reason when we think that we simply could have chosen to do differently and don't give enough weight to the reasons that we didn't it actually makes it harder for us to change in the future As you bring up that sense of tenderness and compassion and understanding for this version of yourself, if it feels comfortable or you feel moved to do so, in your mind you may even try holding or hugging this past version of yourself, taking their hands, doing something comforting, engaging in some gesture that manifests in a more physical sense this understanding that you're feeling emotionally and internally. Shame prevents honesty and shame can get in the way of exploration. So the point here as much as possible is to release any shame that you feel about having engaged in this behavior. And instead Move towards compassion. Move towards understanding. Because that compassion and understanding is actually more likely to help you be less vulnerable to this in the future. When you feel ready, when you feel like you have comforted or been tender towards your past self sufficiently, Go ahead and let the image fade from your mind's eye. As much as possible, also begin putting away the memory of that behavior. While holding on, if possible, to the sense of compassion and tenderness and understanding for yourself. It's entirely possible you'll engage in this behavior again and that's still okay doesn't mean you don't want to change it. It doesn't mean you won't ever change it. It just means to be kind to yourself, to be understanding that you got here in a way that made sense. And it can be hard to change. Once you've let go of the image and done as much as you can to put away the memory, go ahead and take two or three slow, deep breaths. As usual, you might use this moment to stretch, to move your wrists or ankles, roll your neck or shoulders, do whatever you need to, to feel good and ready in your body. And when you feel ready to do so, you can go ahead and open your eyes. Thanks so much, everybody. To learn more about